uh, Senator Cortez Masto of Nevada's right. Thank you. Let me let me follow up in the conversation because as somebody who worked closely with our state division of insurance, I absolutely believe the states have incredible data that should be utilized uh, as well. Uh, and then, Mr. Heller, let me let me touch on this as well. You noted also that Nevada regulators offer expedited review for insurers who submit filings to add discounts for homeowners who take mitigation measures. So let me just start there. What are some of the ways we can encourage insurers to incorporate mitigation incentives when they set the premiums? Well, I, I think, thank you, Senator Cortez Mastro. This is an incredibly important thing. And we're very appreciative. We've worked with the Nevada Division of Un Insurance on exactly this. By laying out really clear uh, discounts to homeowners that insurance companies should be providing based on the science that's out there. And we have the in in Insurance Institute for Building and Home Safety doing a lot of great work on this front, and groups like my uh, colleagues at United Policyholders. We know that when you build stronger roofs, when you um, clear brush, when you take these actions, you can reduce the risk, and that, should, that reduces premiums. Unfortunately, too many companies have not followed through on giving those discounts, but many are, and more in California, they're required to, so that's being built into it. In Nevada, there are these incentives, and states should be looking at Nevada and California Departments of Insurance and looking at what's being done in Alabama, because when we make ourselves safer, we reduce the risk, we reduce the cost. And so this is, this is the kind of work that we should be focusing on right now, rather than some of the conversations about you know, throwing away consumer protections. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. In, in Nevada, we've, we've seen uh, rains and uh, recently um, extreme weather absolutely happening. You see it across the state of Nevada because of that rains and flooding. Flooding that has been devastating to some structures there, um, particularly in southern Nevada. Uh, I know Nevada has worked hard to build defensible space for its communities. I will say the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has helped us in certain areas of the state. There are great partnerships that can happen, but I do agree. There, there needs to be more uh, 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 opportunities and incentives uh, to lower those premium costs, uh, the work that homeowners do. Um, Mr. Harler, let me, let me while I have you, uh, talk about uh, manufactured housing. In your written testimony, you note that people who live in manufactured homes pay more for lower quality homeowners insurance. Uh, can you explain how insurance policies seem to fail some of the 20 million people who, who live in manufactured homes? Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator. That is, that is one of the more uh, disastrous little segments of the market. And of course, it hits uh, lower income homeowners and, and also um, older homeowners um, quite a bit. So these policies that are written for the manufactured homes have are generally now all what's called actual cash value. So they depreciate the value of the home when you need to file a claim. So you don't actually get everything you need to fully rebuild. They have weird uh, exclusions. For example, the HVAC systems in those homes, they're considered contents, which you have which has less coverage than the, what we see in normal homeowners policies, in which they're part of the home for rebuilding. So it's harder to do that. And then for some people, if you can't even get a full, uh, you can't collect your full claim if you don't rebuild in the same place. Well, if your home park doesn't reopen, you can't rebuild in the same place. So you don't even get to use the policy that you've been paying for. And yet these manufactured homes, uh, home policies, which the com market is even less competitive than the regular homeowners market, are more expensive on a per dollar basis and, and sometimes just more expensive altogether than homeowners. So it's a really tough market to be somebody who's living in a manufactured mobile home and trying to get their coverage. Particularly at a time when, when really manufactured homes are, are different than the manufactured homes of the past, correct? And uh, there are more people that should be taking advantage of the lower cost for manufactured homes that put a roof over your head, but oh, still provide you a level of, of comfort and security. Yeah, in a way, the insurance industry is, is trying to uh, ensure uh, homes from decades ago, and we've actually done a really good job of making more affordable housing through manufactured homes, and yet the insurance products are substandard for people who either because they want to or because it's really all they can afford are in these uh, communities and in these types of homes. And we need to do a better job to make the insurance coverage better. And regulators need to pay attention to these forms because they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Ms. Norris, let me let me talk to you and stay on the affordable housing piece because uh, our nation desperately needs affordable housing. Nevada is no different, and it's something I've been working on in the state. Uh, I appreciate your testimony telling us that rising insurance costs uh, undermine not just the future of affordable properties, but those that currently uh, provide homes to people. Can you expand on your statement that affordable housing providers may be forced out of the affordable housing market because of insurance and operating costs outpace allowable or even feasible rents? Yes, thank you for that question, Senator. 
Yes, the affordable housing community runs on, um, a, it's a regulated world, right? No matter, there's a lot of different programs uh, of affordability, but they all run on some basic principles. Number one is the people that move into our communities are people who need to move into our communities. They have, they can't make too much money. So that's rule one. And rule two is we can't charge them too much money to live there. So that's basically the two rules of affordable housing. And so essentially, whenever you have a serious situation like this with these catastrophic increases of expenses that rise quickly, there is no way to do an adjustment of the rents, nor do we necessarily want to. We don't want to just do a, a, like a dramatic increase in rents for folks that can't afford it. But what that leaves us with is a situation where our expenses are crushing our operational margin or even our ability to meet our, our costs. That's a real problem. Because the regulators often, ex for example, with HUD, um, we can go and ask them for a rent increase. But if an insurance premium, which hits in the middle of a year, and we've already got our rent increase, we can't ask for another rent increase. And then if we ask it the next year, it may take them a while, actually a significant amount of time, to actually approve that rent increase. So we're set in a position where those rents can't possibly meet the expenses. That forces us as an owner to make really bad decisions. We have to either stop doing certain services, we have to defer expenses, any expense we can. And eventually, it could end up saying, we just can't afford to do this. Mm -hmm. It could put those properties at risk, which can put at risk people's homes, and that's like 100 people at a time or 200 people at a time. So the impact on affordable housing is significant, um, especially compared to even the market. Does that make? Does it that does. help? Thank, thank you. And I know my time is thank, up. Thank, 